My guest on this week's episode of Suds and Search is Dr. Marie Haynes, owner of Marie Haynes Consulting. Marie is one of the top SEO personalities in the world. She hosts the extremely impressive podcast, Search News You Can Use. She's written for every major publication I can think of, including Moz, Search Engine Journal, Search Engine Land, and many other places. She's a must follow on Twitter at the handle Marie underscore Haynes. I'm gonna start our conversation talking about her podcast, which had over 166 episodes at the time we spoke. Marie interviews some of the top personalities in the industry, but oftentimes she speaks into the microphone about a topic by herself without anyone asking her a question for upwards of 40 minutes. It's like a conference presentation that comes out every week and the content is always superb. Marie is one of the foremost experts on algorithm changes. Whenever Google makes a significant change to how they index or rank websites, SEOs from around the world look to experts like Marie to understand what just happened. I'll nerd out a little bit with her about algorithm changes past, present, and future. I first remember learning about Marie Haynes during the Penguin update, which was arguably the most significant algorithm change in history, impacting about 3% of all searches. It's been a full decade since that update, and I'm going to discuss how Penguin changed the industry forever with Marie. Grab something cold to drink and join me for a conversation with Dr. Marie Haynes. We'll chat about the three specific services she offers at Marie Haynes Consulting. We'll talk about the quality raters guidelines, which she literally wrote the book on, and I'll spend a little time asking her about Wham and Fortnite. Dr. Marie Haynes, welcome to Susan Search. How are you doing? I'm well, thanks. Thanks for having me. This should be fun. I'm looking forward to it. So Search News You Can Use, the podcast uh, that you host, is one of, if not the most popular SEO podcasts in the world. Um, if Thank my you. research is correct, uh, according to Apple Podcasts, you, you've released 166 episodes at this point. So wow. tell anyone who's listening who isn't familiar with the show what, what it's about and what comes to mind when you reflect on 166 episodes. Well, I had no idea it was that many. So... The podcast was initially a way for me to just read out my newsletter. Um, and so we have a newsletter that my team and I produce, although originally it was just me. And uh, I found that by going over all the things in the newsletter, going, oh, Google did this this week and somebody discovered this new way of, uh, you know, making links or whatever, uh, it helped me to learn. Because if you right. can explain something to people, then it's in your head, right? And, uh, and so it sort of evolved over the years. I used to do it with screen sharing and, and the whole newsletter was in there. And now what I do it is I, I use it as a learning tool for me so that when I want to learn something, uh, I either unpack it myself as if I'm talking to myself, <laughs> which it amazes me that people like to listen to me babble onto myself. Uh, or lately I've been having guests where uh, I can just pepper them with questions and learn more about a subject, uh, which works really well as well. Yeah. And you, I think you this is a real challenge. So you have guests on like recently, Glenn Gabe has been on Lily Ray has been on Don Anderson, but often you are speaking yourself for like 40 minutes without anyone asking you questions mm -hmm. or having a conversation with that sounds so daunting to me. Um, you're basically doing a conference presentation, you know, every week or so, like with a pretty, pretty regular cadence. Uh, I would be like, what if I run out of stuff to talk about at the seven minute mark and I need a whole <laughs> show here. I, how do you prepare to, to talk like that? And it seems like it just comes off the top of your head, but it is good and interesting that it's part of that, that newsletter. Yeah, I've done different things throughout the years. So uh, like I said, initially I was just reading through the newsletter and commenting uh, on, on what I thought was interesting. And then uh, for a while, um, what I did was actually write out a script, which I don't tell a lot of people that, but I would dictate it to Google Docs and, uh, mm -hmm. and then read out my dictation. Uh, it took a little bit of correction because Google Docs, uh, you know, doesn't always understand me. Um, and uh, and then I would read it out, including, I, you know, I'd write, ha ha, in there. And, then, and then also, you know, just uh, uh, be an actor, I guess, uh, <laughs> no in kidding. reading it. Um, and now, yeah, now what I do is I, I just take notes um, on, you know, what I want to discuss and uh, and then just go for it. And um, I do a lot of editing. Uh, you know, when we when we finish the podcast, I'll have a listen and go, oh, my gosh, I went on forever about this thing that nobody cares about. And I'll edit that out. Um, but my problem usually is in uh, making it short enough because uh, I talk a lot. <laughs> My husband's very thankful, I think. For, David's very thankful mm -hmm. that I do a podcast now because wow. uh, uh, I used to babble on about absolutely everything to, to do with Google algorithms um, in front of him. And now uh, now I get to do it in front of this uh, uh, audience that I can't see. 
well, our, our, I think our spouses could commiserate with each other about this sort of thing. So I, I, I have a similar relationship <laughs> with my spouse. So, um, uh, you know, a lot of the episodes, it seems to me, are about news that's topical at the time the episode is airing. You mentioned this already. Um, and I've talked to other podcast guests about this, too. It's like part of the job these days as an SEO and as a PBC is, is sort of staying, I don't know, informed about what's happening. So there's a benefit to understanding things like algorithm updates and announcements from Google. You know, many of us in the SEO community, I think, get the latest breaking news from you. I'm wondering where does Marie Haynes get her news from? What are your favorite sources for mm -hmm. SEO news? Good question. Twitter is probably the place where I get the most news from. So, uh, I mean, I have a list of people that I have alerts on for. Uh, anytime John Mueller tweets or uh, most of the time that Barry Schwartz uh, tweets something, I'll take a look at it and decide if that's something that uh, primarily would be interesting for my team to learn. Um, and so I'll all day be sharing stuff in, in our Slack channels with, you know, hey, this is some, something that I learned. And, um, and so Twitter is, is really a good source. Uh, Barry Schwartz, again, Search Engine Roundtable. Um, Barry is amazing for the, mm -hmm. I can't remember, do you, there was a number of articles that, yeah. it was like 60,000 or like some crazy number of articles that uh, Barry has written. <laughs> and so anytime Google does something, Barry writes mm -hmm. about it. And, uh, and so I get a lot of uh, research from there. And then uh, the next part of my routine every morning is to actually do a Google search for Google and, uh, and go to Google News. And I just look at, um, you oh. know, apparently that breaks the internet if you search Google for Google. I don't think it does, so I do it every day. Um, and, uh, and then see what, um, what news has come up about Google and their algorithms and what's interesting. Uh, and then one thing I started doing recently, uh, which has really helped me, and it seems to be well-received, is to take an article that is really complicated. So this morning, I was looking at the most recent article from Bill Slosky, who writes about Google patents. And, uh, and then just break it down into a tweet thread. Right. Uh, and again, uh, you can learn so much because if I have to summarize this and tweet it out uh, in a way that makes sense, well, then now I understand it. Uh, and so I do it all primarily for selfish reasons. So I can, I can learn as much as I can. Well, um, I'm glad you do. I think it's, I think it's been great. So I want to shift gears if we could to, uh, to a conversation about algorithm changes for a little bit. So uh, before we talk about any specific algorithm change, you know, you and your team follow these updates closely. You speak and write about them. Um, and I'm wondering, as you as you study these updates, is there any general theme that that you can take away that Google is looking for, or just as importantly, what they're not looking for, like what, what we shouldn't be doing that might give us some insight? Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll look at those recent algorithm, you know, those recent updates anyway, and sort of distill down any messages that Google might be sending to the community. It's interesting because when I first started looking at Google updates, that's actually what drew me into SEO was um, I had, I was a veterinarian before I was uh, in SEO and I had this website um, for people to ask me veterinary questions. And I was just trying to figure out, you know, why initially I was getting like 30 people a day to my website and then grew it to, uh, I think at, at its most, it was 15,000 a day were, were coming. Um, but to grow it, you know, I had to, uh, I had to learn um, uh, how to do that. Um, and oh gosh, I did the thing that I always do. I see, I babble so much and I forgot what your uh, initial question was. <laughs> and we have a little delay. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm Sorry curious if you look at, if you look at, oh, I know a little yes, bit of delay. So, updates. That's okay. So if, if you look at a lot of these algorithms, yeah, what would, what would you say is any general theme that Google will be giving to us in the SEO community that maybe we should be doing or should not be doing? Right. So when I first started doing this was when uh, Penguin came out. And if you remember, the Penguin update was the one where it went after unnatural links, um, mm -hmm. site owners that had been maybe purchasing or creating low quality directory links or uh, remember Ezine articles, you know, the, all those sites where uh, you could get a link right. and write an article and get your own link with your own keyword anchors and all that stuff. And Penguin destroyed a lot of sites. And so it was a hobby for me to try to figure out like, all right, what did Google do here? And can we recover from it? Um, and, uh, and so back then, when we had Google updates, there was almost always a specific focus. We could look at sites and if we had enough sites together, uh, we could say, well, you know what? 
all of the sites that dropped had these commonalities. Um, you know, maybe they were all taking advantage of low quality links in the case of Penguin. Or when Panda came out, uh, you could easily see that the sites that were hit uh, were often massive sites with huge amounts of content, um, which really wasn't the best of its kind. And uh, and so you could you could come up with strategies for recovery based on uh, the specifics of these algorithms. And in the last few years, that's been really, really hard to do because uh, there aren't single specific things that Google has been working on. So in the last few years, most of the updates, uh, there's been a couple different kinds of updates. Google tells us about core updates where they, uh, if they've updated the vast majority of their algorithm, the, the core mm -hmm. algorithm, they actually tell SEOs about that on Twitter. Um, you can follow uh, Danny Sullivan under the Google search liaison account. And um, when there's a core update, uh, again, Google doesn't say, well, you know, we did this, this, and this. They always refer us to this blog post that they wrote in uh, a couple years ago called What Site Owners Need to Know About Core mm -hmm. Updates. And this blog post is a list of questions that if you go through them, it kind of looks like they're nice ideals, but how would an algorithm measure that type of thing? Um, and really, uh, and this is part of what I'm, I'm talking mm -hmm. about uh, a lot lately is uh, discovering how Google's algorithms actually can determine if a site has substantially more content, uh, more helpful content than competitors, or has information that's insightful and beyond obvious. Uh, and uh, if we look at, and I'm jumping ahead probably a little bit here, but if we look at Google's uh, capabilities as a semantic search engine, then uh, then that really answers those questions. So lately when Google has had uh, either core updates or the other thing we see is these dates where there's wild turbulence and all the tools like the SEMrush sensor and, and tools like that are showing, all right, Google's doing something. There's a lot of sites that are, uh, rankings are shifting all over the place. Um, there really isn't one specific focus that we can see. We can just see generally that in most cases, better content is rewarded. There are changes like if uh, lately we've had product reviews right. updates where Google has given us specific things that they're going after. And sometimes we can see, like Google says, oh, we want to see uh, sites that review multiple products or um, things like that. You know, we could see that type of thing uh, mm -hmm. being rewarded. But generally, it's uh, if you follow the advice in Google's uh, blog post on core updates, uh, that's the key to uh, creating a good website that Google likes. Oh, fascinating. Yeah, you mentioned Penguin. I just saw on Twitter, it's been 10 years since mm -hmm. that, that update came out. I lived through that. That was, that was wild. I mean, uh, all this new terminology, I remember this, like, the whole idea of like a manual action and an algorithmic action was foreign concept to me before Pen Penguin. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I, 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 maybe there's a question there. I wonder, how do you think about Penguin? It's been a decade now. Um, that was the mm -hmm. first one, and I can't believe how how many it was like three percent of all the searches were impacted by it it was massive and uh it was iterative mm -hmm. in nature mm -hmm. um you know as somebody who studies these things that that was really a uh i don't know a, a pivotal moment i think in the whole history of algorithm updates no yeah were, were you working for an agency at the time i was yes oh, yes yeah yeah a lot of agencies had big problem. A lot of agencies went under after, after Penguin happened because a lot of agencies right. were having really good success with link building in ways that really weren't uh, compliant with Google's guidelines, but they worked. They weren't illegal. They weren't immoral. You know, people weren't doing overt black hat, you know, things that were hurting other websites, uh, but they were working. And so the thing that bothered me the most about Penguin was the legitimate good businesses that suffered as a result. Um, and people would argue, well, well, those businesses deserved it because they had an unfair advantage by, uh, you know, by making unnatural links. But really, the majority of the business owners that came to me at the time were just good, honest people who hired an SEO agency. And how are they to know that uh, what the work that the agency was doing would one day be penalized by Google or uh, maybe uh, not counted by Google? Right. Um, so that's what bothered me. And there, we had a time frame where it was almost two years before Google ran 
a, a penguin update. And if you were hit by penguin, you couldn't recover until another update happened. And so I had all sorts of clients that we were saying, let's right. just wait. And, and Google would come out and say, all right, there's going to be one in the next three months. Once uh, Gary Ish said, uh, yeah, it, within the next three months, we'll have an update. And so I had all sorts of clients that were like, I don't know, should I make a new site? And, and we were saying, look, let's just hang in there and see what happens with this next update. Uh, and then it was two years. Uh, and so a lot of businesses really, really struggled because of that. It was not fun. <laughs> hmm. No, I, I, I imagine. Yeah. So, well, interesting. And so let's talk about uh, where, where the state of play is today with link toxicity, manual actions, these kinds of things. You offer a service to do link auditing. Um, I haven't been through a manual penalty in years. Like I haven't see, even seen this in, in search council or anything mm -hmm. like that. So I'm going to be learning a little bit with the audience on this one, but you know, as long as there are search engines, there's going to be black hats trying to manipulate things. There are, you know, whether that's exact match anchor text or PBNs or whatever that is, you know, spammers are going to spam. You know, what does a, a link audit mm -hmm. in 2022 entail? What are, what are you guys looking for? What are you guys seeing when you come across these, these sites? That's a great question because we don't see nearly as many manual actions as we used to. So back in 2000. 12, probably 2013, I had so many people requesting help for manual actions that uh, I had all sorts of people would come to my house and I'd say, look, let me train you how to audit links. And we had big teams of people with no experience just, um, you know, running through link profiles and, and, uh, and trying to. Uh, so what we do is we don't we use tools to gather links and uh, I created a tool to put them all into a spreadsheet. Um, and uh, but we don't use tools to identify which links are unnatural. Um, and there are lots of tools out there that do that. Uh, but the problem is that most of the links that the tools pick up as being unnatural are ones that today Google's algorithms are just ignoring anyways. They're not the ones that are causing a problem. So back in 2013, it, I, and we're talking about two things. If a site had a manual action, then you'll see that in Google Search Console. Uh, so it was very obvious. That's a whole different process than Penguin. Uh, you don't get told that your site's being suppressed. You have to come to somebody like me or somebody who um, analyzes uh, sites regularly to determine, oh, yeah, it looks like this part of Google's algorithms um, negatively affected your site. And um, today, so 2016, Google changed the Penguin algorithm so that it no longer was demoting for the most part. Um, and in most cases, when they come across links that are spammy links or unnatural links, they can just ignore those links. And that can feel like a penalty because, uh, you know, let's say you've been building a ton of guest post links that maybe aren't uh, the highest quality. And then Google's algorithms catch on to that and say, well, whoa, you know, these actually aren't real recommendations. They're self-made links. Why would they count towards a site's page rank? Why would they help us uh, trust a site any better? Um, and so if Google stops counting all of those links, it's going to feel like a penalty because they used to be helping. They used to be propping your uh, pages up. So today when we do uh, link audits, there's two reasons. One is if a site has a manual action, which we do still get some, uh, but really I would say it's only every couple months or so mm -hmm. that somebody reaches out with a, a manual action, um, which is a big change from several per day <laughs> back in you know a decade okay. ago. Uh, and then the other reason to do it yeah. is um, if we think a site is headed towards a manual action. And, and just by looking at the link profile uh, and from our years of experience, we can uh, sort of say, well, you know, it's really obvious that there's unnatural links here. And uh, often we can find evidence that uh, there are certain updates sometimes where we say, ah, this seems to be a link related update uh, and maybe we'll disavow. But we don't do nearly as much disavow work uh, today as we used to years ago, which is a shame because uh, it's fun work to do. <laughs> okay. Okay, awesome. Well, you know, the, the other things you guys do, I, you have th three services. You're very specific, if, if, uh, if I'm understanding your website right. So you have site quality assessments, link auditing, and manual action removal. So, the, you know, mm -hmm. here's the question. Given your reputation, you could probably make a killing doing a bunch of the other services that us agencies do. Um, it seems like there might be a story there. What, why not offer all these services that agency folks offer? What was it about those three services that really excited you? I think it just evolved because 
when I first started learning about Penguin and people came to me and said, I want to hire you to consult with my, on my site, my thought was I'm a veterinarian with an interest in SEO. I'm not an expert on, um, you know, at that time I wasn't an expert in, in SEO. Um, and so I didn't want to take on clients for ongoing SEO work when my expertise was in this one particular area at the, at the beginning was manual actions. And then gradually, uh, bit by bit, as I learned more, um, I started to expand my services and I started to create, well, the first thing I created was a, a report that just told you whether you had been hit by Panda or Penguin. And it was very, very basic. It was just, uh, you'd give me access to your Google Analytics and I'd look at Google organic traffic and say, oh yeah, there was a drop on April 24th, 2012. That's when Penguin hit or you know, on another day where there was a, a Penguin update. And I charged um, $89 for this report. I just pulled the number out of thin air. And I had so many people that wanted this report. It was unbelievable. And so over time, what happened was I just started putting the price up. And, uh, and then I also added stuff to it. So, well, you know, when Panda came out and we started talking about thin content, I, I did some research into, well, what would Google consider to be thin content? Um, what do other SEO experts consider to be thin content? How are they having success in cleaning that up? And so I started uh, adding that as a section on the report. Well, you've been hit by Panda. Here's what we know about Panda. And uh, today, that same report, um, now my team does it, uh, and it's evolved you know, over 10 years, is something that we charge usually a minimum of 7,500 for this report. It's about 150 pages long, and it's filled with um, you know, everything from technical advice to uh, EAT-related advice. Uh, that was the thing that came along later that was very, very interesting to understand what Google was doing with EAT. Uh, and yep. so really, the reports have been our, our main thing. And for many years we had so much business doing these reports that we couldn't keep up with it. I, I couldn't keep up with the demand. Uh, and so I hired people. This was five years ago. I hired uh, my first three full-time employees all at once. And uh, we just started building this business together um, to uh, basically sell these reports. Now we're at the point where you're talking about where we can take all these leads. I mean, uh, we get tons of leads for site audits and site quality reviews and link audits as well. Um, and then actually do ongoing work with them uh, because we have capacity. So we have, um, including myself, we have 11 of us uh, who all work on site audits all day long. And uh, now we have uh, a small subset of those uh, site audits we convert into ongoing work where we just continually work on, all right, well, Google suggested that this could be a sign of quality uh, and you don't have that in your website. So here's how we could implement it, uh, that type of thing. So you'll see us uh, expanding. We, uh, it, it's hard um, growing a services business to take on a uh, huge capacity. And so that's what we've been working on is, uh, is growing um, the skills of the team uh, not just me to strategize, but any any one of my team can uh, put together an excellent strategy for SEO, um, which is a really hard skill to grow in uh, in people. Yes, absolutely. So, well, well amazing. And, and you you mentioned it a little bit. You, you talked about thin content and quality ratings and stuff like that. So I, I really want to make sure I ask you about this before we before we get off. But the the quality raters the quality raters guidelines. So. You literally wrote the book mm -hmm. on quality raters guidelines. It's a forty-page guide. I I saw there. Where, what, where can people go to find the guide, and what will they find when they when they read it? Yeah, you can go to mariehaines.com slash book, and that'll take you to the our QRG book. Um, it's really kind of a summarized version of what we started doing in our site audit, uh, our site reviews. Um, not the technical components and, and other things that we look at, but basically looking at uh, what's in the search quality evaluator guidelines that we can translate into um, actionable advice. And um, we have to caution ourselves because the Google's guide or Google's algorithms are not exactly what's described in the quality rater guidelines. Um, like the raters will be instructed how to find reputation information about a business, but we don't know if Google's algorithms take those same steps that uh, that are outlined in the in the rater guidelines. Um, but that blog post that I was talking about that Google published about what site owners need to know about core updates uh, says right in the blog post that if you can evaluate your site like a quality rater then there's a good chance that Google will want to rank it better. 
uh, that it'll be seen as higher quality. So um, the mm -hmm. book is essentially a, a checklist. Um, we will be coming out with a new edition, which if you buy the current edition, you'll get the new edition. So don't let anybody, uh, don't let that dissuade you from buying it. Um, and then we're also coming out with another, uh, uh, it's a bit of a shorter book um, based on the questions in Google's core update post. There's 20 questions that they say to ask about your site. Um, and very specific uh, advice on, well, when they say uh, this, here's how you can measure if that's an issue on your site, uh, and here's how you can improve upon it as well. Um, so I, I'm pretty proud of those resources because I, I think I've, I've probably read the QRG. I mean, it's a massive book, and I, I'm in it almost every day trying to get a reference for something, yeah. trying to, uh, you know, one of our clients has a, a problem. We can say, well, look, this is outlined as a problem in the QRG. So we think it's something that Google's algorithms may be going after as well. Um, there's, it's a gold mine of information. I don't know why people don't spend more time in there. I love it. I love it. Well, listen, I've got to, I've got to shift to everyone's favorite part of the show. This is where Greg Gifford gives me a question for the guests, but he gives me no context. So it's a bit of a high wire act for both oh, no. of us. And for Dr. Marie Haynes, he has Wham. Does Wham ring a bell to you at all? It's sort of like the, the band maybe? I don't know. Yes, that's all. That's all. Just every time I see Greg, we uh, we remember something about Wham. We both like Wham. Come on. Andrew Ridgely was the best part of Wham. I don't know. Do you remember Wham? Are you? No? Back in the 80s? I do, yeah. George Michael, yeah, Andrew yeah, Ridgely. Sure. And George Michael got yeah. all the attention, you know, um, but uh, Wham's got some great music. They had the, the hats in the music video. I remember. Yeah. Um, so he has a bonus one for you, which is Fortnite. Does that ring a bell to you, you at all? Fortnite? Fortnite? Like the I, video I, game? Maybe? I play a ton of Fortnite. I have this theory that video games like Fortnite, especially Fortnite, train your brain and they help you to learn better. So I don't know how much you know about Fortnite, but I mean, it's a, it's a shooter game, mm. very like cartooned sort of a uh, shooter game. And uh, it also has this building component where, um, you know, you need to be very, very fast to, to build pieces, to edit through pieces, to, to protect yourself with these pieces. And in order to learn, there's a massive learning curve, which seems to be really easy if you're 13 years old, uh, but not so much if you're like old enough to be the mom of one of those, <laughs> those kids. Um, and so for me, when I first started, it was impossible. I, I could not grasp it. And, uh, and it was a challenge for me to just like get a little bit better at it. And I found that in doing so, um, when I train my brain to learn something in Fortnite, I, f I feel like it actually improves your brain's ability to, to learn. It teaches me how to learn things quickly. Um, and it's also a lot of fun too. I, I actually use it almost, I know this sounds ridiculous, but as a form of meditation, because throughout the whole day, my brain is thinking about wow. what Google's doing, about running my business, about this question that somebody asked about SEO. Uh, and it's very, very hard to shut that off. And so with Fortnite, it takes all of my brain power to, uh, to function and to do it. And I can't think about Google while I'm uh, playing Fortnite. So um, most days I'll play at least an hour of mm -hmm. Fortnite and, uh, and just unplug. And I play with my kids as well too. So that's a, a fun thing to do. Greg plays Fortnite as well. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. That's a, that's a great no context questions from Greg as usual. So, um, well, listen, Marie, where if, if you mentioned the website and where we can get the book, I also want to point people to your Twitter. Where is the best way to get in touch with you? What's your favorite social media? Um, if people are interested, how can they connect with you? I'm on Twitter all the time. So it's Marie underscore Haynes. Um, and, uh, we actually made that part of my job. So I loved social media so much that, uh, we worked me out of, um, most of the operations. I mean, I still contribute, but, uh, uh, gave me more time to, um, to learn stuff and to share what I've learned. So, uh, Twitter's the best place. I've recently started, um, being active on LinkedIn. I'm giving that a, a, a try. And um, I'm amazed by the reach on LinkedIn. There's a, a lot of really, really good connections there. So I'll probably be publishing some more stuff there. Uh, we don't do a whole lot on Facebook. Uh, I did publish one TikTok. <laughs> we might do some more. My daughter uh, uh, grew a TikTok account to 40,000 followers, which blew my mind because she didn't have any advice from me or anything. She just figured out how uh, uh, TikTok's algorithms were working. So uh, she's instructing me on making funny TikToks. The first one I made, 
I said to her, is this too cringy? And she said, well, cringe does well on TikTok. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's a, but don't go to TikTok for <laughs> SEO advice. <laughs> Twitter's definitely best. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you, Marie. Thank, thank you for coming on. I've you mentioned off camera. I've been a longtime fan of yours. Continue, uh, you know, I continue to admire all the work that you're doing and I love following you on Twitter. And, um, you know, you're also a very fun person to have a beer with in the day. So, uh, <laughs> thank you for coming on. I'm going to give you a virtual cheers for now and then, uh, hope to see you in person at some point here in the near future. But for everyone else watching, we'll be back next week with another episode of Suds and Search. Thanks again, Marie. Thanks for having me. It was fun.